Welcome to Radio Labyrinth Presents. We haven't had an interview show in a couple of weeks, so we have a great guest tonight who has been on Radio Labyrinth in the past, I believe, to promote something called Vape the Musical. But our guest this week is Brian Troxell. He's a voice actor and an actor-actor. He's the owner, producer, director, actor at Sketchworks Comedy, Atlanta's longest sketch comedy company. And he's also the anchor of their weekly news break program, which has been running longer than COVID, and streams on MobFi TV and Sketchworks social media pages. He's performed over 175 audiobooks across every genre you can imagine, except for porn. Uh, I don't know why I would, you know, the, the porn books have to be really good. You just have to grunt. And he narrated Audible's Daily Wall Street Journal morning read under the name Alexander Quincy from 2015 until it was unceremoniously canceled at the end of November 2021. Brian is represented by AMT and can be seen in Hawkeye on Disney Plus and the upcoming fourth season of Cobra Kai which I believe now is on Netflix, not YouTube TV. If I'm wrong, tell me. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. It's yeah. been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. When did we have you on for vape? I think I want to say uh, 2019, so two years ago, is right when all the lawsuit shenanigans started going down, the yeah. cease and desist and all that stuff. How'd that play out? I hope you won. It is, it is not played out because uh, COVID uh, shut down oh. all court systems forever. We're at the point now where all the motions have been filed and it just went back and forth. So it's now we're just waiting on the judge to make a decision. And that could be, you know, it could be tomorrow morning. It could be three months from now. So I'm just we're you waiting. think a judge would just look at that and go, this is stupid. You, you would think that <laughs> that's what we've been thinking for the last <laughs> two years. But in the meantime, you've got everything else going on. You 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 survive, managed to survive the uh the real bad part of the pandemic when everything was shut down. So when we say the pandemic, which is still going on. Right. But now we're living with it and learning how to live with it and, and go in and out of places again. So you managed to survive 2020, the year uh, that uh, this all started. Right. And uh, sketch work still going strong. Still going. I mean, uh, we had, um, we had two, we had two shows uh, that was scheduled to go in April and May of 2020. And we were actually in rehearsal for the first one. Uh, and then everything got shut down. So no more live stuff. We had, uh, we took one of those live, we actually went, the, one of the live shows had to do with like workplace humor and we revisited that and none of it is funny anymore because the workplace has changed. Right. Uh, the other one was a sequel to our all female show Heels called Heels Up. And we were supposed to do that again in August of 2021. And then Delta blew through. So oh. we postponed it again. So now we're probably looking to do that uh, in March, I want to say. We did do a one-night uh, live show at the All the Laughs Comedy Awards uh, back in October. So that was fun. It was outdoors but and was cold as <laughs> anything you want to say that's cold. But it was a lot of fun just you know being able to do it again. Well, thankfully, it's December, which means it's going to be in the 70s, and you can get back out and do it again. Yeah, yeah you get our, we had our fall summer and then an ice storm the day after. Yes, that. an ice yeah. storm that sheds power down. So realistically, what's it looking like for next year as far as doing live shows and appearances in front of people? Now, I mean, do you, have, do, you do like a certain amount of shows a year and then you uh, have to do a lot of practicing and everything up until that point? Yeah, the thing with sketch, I mean, it's not like improv where you can get your, you know, your improv group up there and just do a show. Uh, we write everything in advance. We ha usually have, I want to say, like four weeks of rehearsal, like a couple of times a week. And then we have like tech week. And so it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of build up. So it's not, it's so it's a lot of prep that goes into it. So uh, I think uh, our main theater that we performed out of Village Theater, I think they're still on a 50 percent capacity. They're on some sort of capacity limit. Mm -hmm. And they require vaccine vaccinations and all that. So I, I guess at this point with uh, Omicron coming out, I don't see that changing. Uh, so it's just a case of, OK, let's do let's do a show for 50 percent capacity. So uh, we want to talk about Hawkeye. Now, I, I came to the to the show late. Everybody started it before me on the show. And everybody loves it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I don't know. I kind of have Marvel fatigue. Plus, I'm obstinate. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to watch it. But anyway, I said, I'm going to put it on. And I watched it. And of course, it was really, really well done. And it's great. And it's action packed. And the story's good. Mm -hmm. And it's enjoyable as all get out. And I noticed you right away. Thank said, you, Brian. And uh, I had seen 
you were in something, but they had cut scenes, but I didn't put two and two together because I didn't really, I just saw it. And I'm like, okay. And I didn't see Hawkeye or whatever. And then when I saw it in Hawkeye, I'm like, yeah, you could have been in it more, but what you were in it, you had a good impact. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, again, I haven't, I didn't read all the, they did, they're very secretive. So I've only seen, read the scripts, the sides we had on the day. Uh, but I, I, what I love about there are two things I love about Hawkeye, about the show, even if I wasn't in it, is uh, the, the emphasis on comedy. Yeah, um, it's a it's a it's almost a comedy first and foremost. And and the the, the director of my episodes, uh, Reese Thomas, was at Saturday Night Live uh, for over a decade. He was basically Lorne Michaels number two, directed all the, the the film stuff. And then Bert and Bertie were the other directors for the other three episodes, and they have a big comedy background. Uh, all the Atlanta uh, talent that they hired were all sketch. Clayton English is a stand up and has been forever. Uh, Adele Drahos has been an improviser with with Whole World. Uh, so it's a it's a it's it's a, almost like a uh, like an action comedy mm -hmm. more so than a than a superhero show. And that's the other thing is like uh, nobody, none of the characters on the show, none of the the heroes, or the villains have any powers. Right. They're all regular people. So it's not like you know folks are going to come flying in saving the day. I, I think it's a great character action comedy show. Yeah, and it pokes fun of itself, and it pokes fun at, at a little bit at uh, at the superhero culture because you can mm -hmm. see the superhero, you know, and Hawkeye's tired of seeing it all that, and lots of Atlanta in there too. Uh, yeah, all other, especially episode three was huge Atlanta. I've not watched episode three. I've only seen, that just, just dropped. Uh, just today. came out today. Yeah, right. Yeah, but originally, um, uh, I was in episode one. I'm, I'm not going to give away any spoilers, but in episode one, I had one more scene. Um, if you'll recall when the, the, the bad guys broke into the auction room, um, Gary was supposed to get buried under a pile of rubble, like from my waist down. And so, uh, I was supposed to be, you know, screaming for help. And then you see Kate Bishop show up, you see her feet plant down in front of me. And it's like the first epic hero shot of Kate Bishop in the Ronin costume. And then she drags me to safety. Um, we didn't have time to film that. I was there for three days in January and for a week in March. We didn't have time to film that in January. Um, so that got cut. I was supposed to be back in episode six, the finale, to do some more stuff. Uh, but because that rescue was the setup for all the stuff I was supposed to do in episode six, they fell behind again when I was back in March. And so they're like, well, since we never filmed the setup, we can't take the time to film a pay the payoff. So you will not be in episode six. Ah, that sucks. That sucks. But... Well, the, the hard thing was is that uh, that Haley Steinfeld had a had a drop dead date. She had to go film Dickinson, so it's like literally she had to stop filming Hawkeye on this date. So they couldn't just keep pushing things out. They had to start cutting stuff. Right. So that's how, what happened there. How was it working with her? Uh, it was great. She was good. Um, uh, she had her own tent on set, which was nice. Oh, yeah. I guess you have to, you know, since you're a star and all that. But no, she was she was nice. She was she was great. Every everybody on the show was great. It was an amazing experience. And where um, did they where did they shoot your stuff? It was yeah, a, I was gonna ask that. Their studio? Uh, it, the, the first the first stuff, the the auction stuff was um uh, at actually at Tyler Perry Studios because the Marvel Studios were full. Uh, so they filmed uh, a lot of stuff at Tyler Perry Studios. And then the stuff for episode six uh, was at a hotel in Midtown, and I don't want to say any more about that because right. I might give okay. anything away. But uh, yeah, so I was, I was, I was on studio once, and then, and then on location. In the LARPing time. scene from episode two, is that mm -hmm. where the LARPing is? Is that did they go to New York to shoot that, or did they? Shoot I, I know they filmed in New York um, last fall. Okay. I don't think the LARP stuff was in New York. I'd have to I'd have to ask um, Adele or, or Clayton. I don't think the LARP stuff was in New York because I don't think they got cast until the last minute. So that might have been here in Georgia somewhere. There was a lot of snow, but that could have been fake as far as I know that the uh, the walking scene in episode three with the dog and Hawkeye and Haley, those those three those were shot in Washington Square Park. Yeah. So that that was in New York. They did they did do a lot of, of New York location shooting before they came down here to Atlanta. There's a bunch of exterior shots that you can tell are definitely New York, but then a bunch of shots that you can see Atlanta if you're familiar with it. Right. Yeah. And how they like to turn it into New York. Yeah. And they in mix Marvel, it together you know. really well. Yeah. yeah. And they do stuff like put, you know, put blue screens on background windows and things like that, and they'll just project New York uh in the background. 
And the giant lights in downtown Tucker a couple of weeks ago. These, I mean, I don't know if they were lights, but they were giant screens that had a, like a, a ring of lights around them. They were humongous, and they were right. They had the streets shut down. They were shooting something, or what was it? What is it? It's outlaw with Pierce Brosnan. So okay, pretty interesting. Just everywhere, all over the city, constantly using us as a set. I love it. Yeah, well, I mean, if you look back to, uh, uh, I think, Watchmen um, on HBO, like the, the main thing happened right there on the square in Decatur. And, just yeah. like, that's, and you can tell if you're from. Yeah, Decatur. it was obvious. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they totally didn't disguise it as anything. No, no. You even saw the guy who always bums change off me when you get off of Marta. Uh, <laughs> he was there as well. Now, the upcoming uh, Cobra Kai, um, any, anything you can you can dish on that? I uh I don't want to dish too much, but I also I also don't think I signed an NDA, so uh, <laughs> they're not they're not as they're not as cranky as marvelous. Um, basically, uh, I'm in I think three episodes uh, of Cobra Kai, and if you'll recall, back in season one, uh, there's the 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 board that runs the tournament, the tournament board. Ralph Macchio's character, uh, Daniel, was one of the mem- the board members, but now he is a now that he's a sensei and running his own uh, karate school. He can't be on the board because he's not he's not an impartial person. So they needed to find somebody to replace him, and, and I play that person who replaces him on the tournament board. Nice. Season four. Do you have to, do you get to say sweep the leg? <laughs> I I don't, but I do get to I do get to basically call them out for you know, running tournaments where boys kick the crap out of girls and like <laughs> hey don't you think that's a little weird. So I do get the I do get the tournament rules changed for season four. So Ooh. the big climactic next tournament in season four is a little bit different than the last one in season one. Was Karate Kid a big uh, a big movie in your life when you were younger? Um, what was it? Eight, I was in high school when it came out. It was four. I, yeah, so I was in high school when it came out. Yeah, I'm ancient. Uh, so it, it, it really wasn't. I saw it. My 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 sister loved that movie. She saw it so many times. So I, I think I saw it just because she watched it all the time. But I was, it was I mean, it was, it was a good movie, but it was never, you know, it wasn't one of my all-time favorite. I didn't hate it, but it doesn't, you know, I wasn't like a super huge, I didn't have like a Cobra Kai, I mean, a Karate Kid lunchbox or anything like that. <laughs> that was, uh, it was something that I recorded off HBO. And then it, would, it was one of those movies that you watched, not every day, but maybe every other day. That's mm-hmm. the kind of childhood I had, especially in the summer. You know, watch that, 16 Candles, Breakfast Club, every other day exclusively. Or Red Dawn, that was another one. Red Dawn, yeah, that one. Yeah, I was I would I would watch uh what History of the World Part One and Blazing Saddles and all those I think Mel, comedies. Mel Brooks book came out today. I gotta get that on oh. Yeah, that'd be a good one to pick up. What's yeah. this book about? <laughs> all about me, it's called. Yeah, I know. There you go. Assuming it's about Mel Brooks. Yeah. Well, I asked that because the the fact that they brought this show back that had uh, they bought the, the you know the original people back for this series a couple mm-hmm. years ago it started out on YouTube and uh, that was a much loved film. There were what three sequels? I think. I know yes. Karate, two, Karate yeah. Kid three, and then there was and then they did the, the next the, the next yeah. Karate Kid. Yeah, and then uh, then there was the one with um, or Jaden Smith. Yeah, right. Jaden the reboot. Yeah. 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 And um that one didn't do so well. But to take that to take that franchise that's so old and so far away and bring it back and have it be relevant and really, really well done is just amazing to me. And you know, it's like there's certain things that they can they can tap into and mine from that era and bring into the, the modern era. Very few work, and that's one of them that does. Yeah, and I think they've done a they've done a just a brilliant job of not, I mean, yeah, there is sort of a nostalgia factor to it because there has to be but they've also done a really good job you know bringing all these characters ahead what 35 years yeah. and and bringing giving them all new lives and and switching them around it's not just you know uh, you know the, the the bad kid versus the good kid you know Danny LaRusso does some awful things and yeah he's wealthy you know, privileged and and Zabka's character is poor and, right you know just a drunk and a bad dad but he wants to do well and I think they've done a great job with the development of each year. It's not like they're not telling the same story over and over and over again. They're actually building a whole new, a whole new world and a whole new storyline out of all these, out of all these, even though know, they keep bringing everybody back from the first. Yeah. Movie. Even the kid who wore the uh, make and bacon shirt with the two pigs having sex. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd have, I'd have to check the Cobra Kai wiki to see. If that <laughs> 
Um, when is that coming back? I think it drops December 31st. I don't know if it's all the episodes or if they're stretching them out, but I know, I know that the first, at least the first episode drops December 31st. Netflix is starting to experiment with that weekly release idea. Mm -hmm. I think because a lot of these streaming services are getting more views that way, or at least keeping the buzz going long enough. Yeah. I mean, it it makes, it makes sense. Uh, You know, instead of everybody talking about it for a day and then binge watching, it just carries it out, stretch it out, stretch it. I like that because it, it's like when we grew up, it's normal television mm-hmm. watching. You had to wait. You had to wait an entire summer to find out that Kristen, spoiler alert, shot JR. You had to mm-hmm. wait. You had to wait. And uh, I had it. I, I had an I shot JR shirt that summer. You did? Yeah, I did. That's cool. I love that show. And, and I will occasionally watch it if I see it on some place. A lot of good services, though, they're, they're, they put out like three or four episodes to, to appease the millennials who only binge watch stuff. That's right. No instant gratification for you, millennials. Mm-hmm. Wait. Hawkeye, I mean, that's Apple uh, and uh, Disney do a really good job of that. Mm-hmm. They, you know, and I love the fact that I didn't have to, that I didn't get to binge watch The Mandalorian. You know, I had to wait. And HBO everyone, Max does it too. Yeah, yeah. that's right. So they, 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 got the, they got the sweet spot. And you can take a show that nobody, like a show like Squid Game where nobody really knew anything about it. You dump that all at once. Everybody talks about it. Now when it comes back, he could, they could drop that weekly and people would tune in every week. Right. You got you to get the hook, the hook in your cheek first. Yes. So let me ask you, were you involved with the, the campaign at all? I, I was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. I, cause I know, cause I know you and I were on a table read uh, yeah, and, I, never, and, yeah. and I, I think they had me tabbed for, I want to say an Elvin, Elvin Knight, like a, a, a really depressed, sad, bitter <laughs> shell of his former self, Elvin Knight. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I think it's supposed to be in like an episode eight, but I don't think they've gotten there yet. I think, okay, I think like they're the still season. working to raise money to make the episode. So yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, it's, nice it's yeah, that would be like a different, a different uh not a comedic role for sure so yeah no i was i was looking i mean i'm sure i mean uh, a lot of sketchworks people are, are involved in the campaign so i look forward to hopefully being in it it's a i'll be in concept. anything i'll be I'll, I'll, I'll honestly you know i'm an actor i'll be in anything you were in that bigfoot movie that we talked we talked to zach lamp lamp love yeah i was, was i was briefly in that who'd you play in that one of the I was one of the news one of the news newscasters and uh Zach didn't have cue cards, so he had to scribble, <laughs> scribble cue. And his handwriting is terrible. <laughs> so he'd, so he'd be he'd, he'd hold this thing up, and like me and Crystal, and I think uh, Kimberly Hamilton, Crystal Lowe, and Kimberly Hamilton played the, the news folks, and we were all like, <laughs> "Don't squint in the camera." It's like, I can't read. What? You, what? That was a well done film. I enjoyed it. Yeah, no, it was. They did. They did a really good job. The twists and turns toward the end um, made it even more enjoyable because I had no idea any of that was coming, and uh, threw me for a loop. No, it's, it, and it's and it's uh, having its uh, its life on Showtime now. It's it's uh, it's kicking around on Showtime and it pops up in my feed like all the time now. That it's it? been well, that's good pushed that's onto good. Showtime. Yeah, and all the, 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 the all, everybody in uh, I mean it's a weird comedic community here in Atlanta, but yeah, I've known those guys for a while, and they're they're, they're good peoples. They do funny stuff. What else are you working on right now? Anything you can talk about? Uh, I did. I did uh, two days on a show that I can't talk about a couple of weeks ago, uh, but it's a long running show that uh, everybody's wanted to be on over the years. Uh, and I think that'll be out in the spring. A weird, a weird role on, on that show. Uh, other than that, I, I had a, um, during the summer, since I booked Cobra Kai, when did I film that? I, film, I booked that in February, filmed it in March. Uh, and then from there until I booked this last show, I had, and this count may be off, 122 auditions for films and TV shows in a row without booking anything. Oh, I had like a, I had like a few of them. No, these were all tapes, tape. but just like okay. I had a few avail checks. But it's like, no, I'm sorry. Oh, here's our, here's what all you need is a, approval from the director and producer. And I never heard back. 122 in a row man now now if you were an optimist which i'm not <laughs> you would say but brian 
you got 122 auditions in like eight months. That's really good. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> still sucks banging your head against the wall. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so that was, that was my summer uh, on the, uh, the film and TV front. And then I lost the, uh, the wall street journal job uh, this, uh, this week that got canceled by audible, which was kind of annoying. Uh, yeah. Other than that, um, audiobooks and sketchworks. Oh, yeah. tell me about the audiobook process. You have to be a good character actor to be able to do one that people want to listen to. I've listened to so many and the ones where people aren't good at, I mean, they might be have great voices and everything, but if you can't be a care, if you can't read in character and you can't be a storyteller, then right. it just takes me right out of the story. Yeah. So tell me about that process and, and what you do. Well, for fiction, obviously that's that's the case. And it's one of the things, one of the reasons I love doing audiobooks is I can play anybody that's not based on how I look or or my physicality. I can literally play anybody. I can play like, you know, a, a pregnant runaway 14-year-old girl. And <laughs> wow. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> Oh, I'm pregnant and I'm running away. Yeah, see, you can't, you can't. You just, you just, you just soften up your voice and young it, young it down a bit. But you, you don't go full Monty Python. Uh, right. uh, I love your spam. But uh, for you know, for fiction, it's it's actually I do a lot of prep work because um, you don't know which characters are going to stick around and what they're going to do. So I'll read the entire book uh ahead of time and i keep a, a notebook and anytime a new character shows up i write down who they are and any descriptives what they look like you know anything they the author throws in there what they sound like uh and then i'll sort of get a feel and i'll read things out loud as i go along and then when i'm done i'll you know if there are any important uh sections i might go back and rehearse those a bit um because you don't get i mean you don't get a lot of time to rehearse them you're just there and you're doing it. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's like, it, I actually is, it is almost ruined reading for me for fun. <laughs> the last time I sat down to read a story, I just started going, okay, so this guy is, he's like, stop it. Just enjoy the damn story. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll go through and I'll take, I'll, I'll just, I'll just make all sorts of any descriptive word that comes out. And then at the end, you know, I'll go back. And if there's like, oh, there's 17 indiscriminate, white guys sitting around a table how do i differentiate them in this one scene or how do i you know this person sounds too similar to this person how do i how do i shake that up and then yeah, it's like you said you just got it yeah it's 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 you know the voice is one thing but the acting is important and you have to enable you have to inhabit and be able to switch back and forth if you're having a, a dialogue with two different characters you've got to go back and forth between them for each line have, have you had to do any ethnic voices i have is that uncomfortable nowadays or is there a way around it? Now I've been doing audiobooks for 10 years. Um, and nowadays it's more uncomfortable than it was in the early days. Um, when you're doing, I've done some older books, like some, like, you know, pulp short stories from the thirties. And there was one that I did. I, I think it was a manly Wade Wellman story. It was, but it, but it was like a, you know, the thirties adventurer. And he had a, he had a, a, a Chinese Butler, as most care, most adventurers did in 1930 stories, and all of the Butler's dialogue in the book was written in yellowface. Oh, uh. so I had to do it that way because it's in the book that way. Right. So right. that's that's a little that's a little uh, it's a little awkward. Uh, It'd be more awkward if you read it in that if you read it. The way it was written, but didn't put the affectation on the voice. <laughs> right. <Far from. laughs> or just make it, yes, professor. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you find it harder or easier to do like, uh, like a, a nonfiction um, historical book as, as opposed to like the Forgotten Realms stuff uh, that, you, that you did so much of? I, yeah, I did do a, I did do a few. Uh, D and D books. Uh, it's it's a different it's a different thing. Uh, this the stuff for um, for nonfiction. Uh, it's it's about it's mostly making sure you have your pronunciations ahead, all straightened out ahead of time, um, because you're not doing voices. Like if you if, if if I'm doing a nonfiction book and there's like quotes from people, I don't I don't like make the quotes different. I I did when I started, and it sounded really stupid. 
like I did, uh, I did, I did a book about the, I think one of the San Francisco giants, uh, world series teams. And I, this was when I was first starting. And so I like, Oh, manager, Bruce Boshi, I can do, I can do a Bruce Boshi impression. <laughs> and so I did. And it's like, Oh, wait a minute. This is, and then it, it was, it was a terrible it was a disaster. So now I have like a quote voice and a, and a narration voice, but it's mostly about pronunciations and, 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 you know, sounding like, you know, you know what you're talking about. Um, I, one of one of a book I did recently was I think a history of the Teutonic Knights. I've, I've never heard of the Teutonic Knights. Let me read this book and become familiar. It's like, no, I have a doctorate in the history of the Teutonic Knights. And this is the book I read to learn. So it's like every obscure Polish Lithuanian <laughs> city castle name, so many names that I couldn't even, couldn't even find stuff for. So that was the trick there. Uh, and then I, I did like a philosophy. It was like a, somebody's analysis of Immanuel Kant. And I, I didn't know what I was talking about, like just like paragraphs of just sentences about stuff. And it's just like, I, I don't know what these, I don't know what this means. I'm just saying words. I hope you understand, but I'm not, I don't know what I'm talking about. Well, at that point, I, guess, I assume it's up to the author and, and his construction of what you're reading would, would yeah. be where it comes in. You're just the, the conduit. I guess. Yeah, I'm, obviously, good good books make good audiobooks. I mean, it it all starts with the writing, and um, it's it's that it, Audible has. Okay, so when you rate an when you rate an audiobook on Audible, there's three ratings: there's an overall rating you can give, a story rating, and a uh, performance rating. And I've done I've done some lousy books. I'm not going <laughs> to say what they are, but I've done some lousy books. But as long as but I I don't I don't slack off on them. I still you know do my best. You know my my job is to get that performance rating higher than the story rating, whether those are two and a half stars and two stars versus four point nine stars and four point eight stars. Right. If 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 the performance is better than the story, wherever those numbers are, I've done my job. It would be the exact opposite if you were listening to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. The story is great, but boy, that was one of the worst performances I've ever listened to. And I listened to the whole thing. Really? Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's sad because it was such a fascinating uh, novelization of a movie that I really liked. You know, Tarantino wrote the novelization of it, added so much more depth to the characters and told different stories that you don't get to see in the film. But it was narrated by Jennifer Jason Lee, who is a fantastic actress, but just didn't have the, the to me, didn't tell the story well. I thought right. Very distracting. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing. Like some, I mean, I've, I've also there have been a couple of books that I've done where you know I, I, I you know, I crapped the bed. Like, oh, well, that was terrible. Not many, not many. Don't get me wrong. I can count on one hand, but you know, and also it, it's what I do. What, what I like about audiobooks is it's, uh, it's all on me. It's mm -hmm. like it's all on me. It's, it's, it's. I, I play all the characters. You know, I don't have a director. If, if I screw up, I ruin the book. And if I don't. I get the, I get the, uh, the kudos for it. I still, my favorite, my favorite bad review and I, I, I read them <laughs> because why not? Right. I like reading about myself. My favorite bad review is, uh, something, what was it? I, in the future, I hated this performance so much in the future. I will avoid Troxel like he was poison. <laughs> That's awful. All right. Well, at least you're creative about it. Ugh. I'll avoid Troxel <laughs> like he's poison. I'm going to go seek out your audio books. How about that? Okay. I've done, I've done a lot of, uh, yeah, can lot you of recommend any? Yeah. Um, my, my favorite, my all time favorite uh, that I've done is a book called uh, bull mountain uh, and its sequels uh, like lions and hard cash Valley. Um, it's written by a guy named Brian Panowich who lives out in Augusta uh, Southern uh, hillbilly noir, I believe is the, uh, I believe is the, uh, the, the, the term for the genre that they're in uh, bull mountain is one of the few books of mine that I've listened to multiple times because the story is so good. Uh, it's point was like, it's one of those where it's like, I forget it's me doing it, if that makes any sense. But that's probably my all-time favorite. Um, uh, and uh, he actually, Panowich actually sought me out to be his narrator. He said, if I ever get published, Trox was going to, because he heard me do a Daniel Woodrell book, which was one of my first ones. And uh, he said, he's, he's got the right voice. And then uh, he found out I was in Georgia like he was. And so I was like, hey, so I'm I'm his guy. Right. In fact, he, he actually texted me when Hawkeye came out and he said, if I ever get my dream job of writing a Marvel comic, I'm putting Gary in there. I don't care what the title is. Gary is going to be a character in my comic. That's like, great. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Well, I just saw that you're on a ton of books on Audible. 
Yeah, 170 of them. Nice. Yeah, and I, I mean, Bull, Bull Mountain's my favorite, and the sequels are my favorite. Um, but I've done like uh, uh, some of the nonfiction, some of the what's yeah, nonfiction. Like I've done uh, Apollo Eight is a really good one. Um, there's 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 quite a few. I've, I've been lucky enough to to do some really good books. How long does it take your average novel to to narrate? They say, they say. Um, you should get an hour of finished audio for every two hours you're in the studio. I'm a little faster than that for something like nonfiction. If it's still like conversationally written nonfiction, I can zip through, I can zip through like, you know, an hour of recorded audio and in like an hour, 20 hour, 30 minutes. If it's something I'm really taking my time on, like a really good fiction book where I'm jumping between characters and I want to make sure everything's right and everything's perfect, then I, I can get a little slower, but usually you know, two so like a, t- a ten hour audiobook, which is probably an average novel length, maybe somewhere around nine, ten hours, about twenty hours in the studio. And is it commonplace for you to, um, like, let's say you're starting a book and and you get into the book maybe a couple of hours and then realize that the the pace or the you've gotten the characters more locked in. Well, is it possible to go back and then? start re-recording because you changed the pace or the character styling? You can certainly do that. It just makes the process longer. Uh, I, I only did that once. There was a, I cannot remember the name of this book to save my life because I'm old and my brain doesn't work, but it was a book. It had like, uh, it took place as three brothers in Memphis. Uh, it was a, a fiction book. Uh, and one of them just got out of prison, I believe. And it was, it was a, I got, I, I had two days in the studio and I just, I just wasn't getting it. It, it, it I, I wasn't happy with what I was doing and I'd read the book and I, I figured, you know, I knew the characters and I, I just, I was like, I don't, I don't know why this one is giving me trouble. And, and so we ended up uh, getting a call to the author and I talked to the author for about 30 minutes and just like, okay, it, it just, it just solidified a lot of things in my head. And I did go back and start that one again from scratch. But uh, usually that's, that's where preparation is so important. I, 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 that's why I do so much prep ahead of time because you don't want to get in that situation where you're halfway through and you go, oh, oh, I should have done this. Yeah. Uh, one, actually, I think it was the sequel to Bull Mountain. I think, I think it was Like Lions. Uh, we, we, were, we were, I think, chapter eight or chapter nine or something like that. And one of the, one of the a character had just shown up in that, in that uh in that chapter and we had we had done it we we gotten halfway through that chapter and uh at, at uh listen up audiobooks uh, the studio now known as lantern audio at the time keith david just happened to have walked in to to have done a book and so he saw keith david walking by and i was like oh this character would be great as keith david <laughs> and so he went back and started again uh that chapter and we just did him as as keith david and it was like Oh, it's uh, that was just that was just weird just one of those things where like you know what that would be a great <laughs> choice for this guy i love that guy he's such a great voice and yes any film he's in he's the iconic character from that film pretty much yep yep he makes everything he's in better they live he made that better mm-hmm. even though that is pretty cool on its own but that is his character being a skeptic and fighting with roddy piper and of course platoon yeah, the most memorable line that I'm not going to quote right now. Even his even his small appearance in uh, Requiem for a Dream, a movie I will not watch twice because it's yeah. so awful. I mean, not not bad, but so harrowing to watch. He had one of the one of the better. What does he say? Because I know it's pretty, but I didn't take it out for air. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before we let you go, um, where can I get one of those Ronin swords? Well, you have to be invited to the <laughs> underground auction. Okay. <laughs> I think it was awesome. The sword is longer than the the hilt that came, it comes yeah. out of. I believe I believe the sword may have been CGI then. Yeah, I know the Triceratops head, Triceratops <laughs> skull was actually there. That was an that was an on set thing, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that yeah, that whole that whole cellar was just a set. It was weird. It just but it was like so. Even Simon Callow, who's been in everything, and like oh my, everything, it's all just so real. Told you so real. <laughs> what he am I seeing? Him. I've seen him in a million things, haven't He's I? He's basically been every Charles Dickens in every uh, British uh, production. He was also, and I'm, I'm, I, I didn't ask him about this. He was also the villain in Ace Ventura Two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. When nature calls. 
Was he in Amadeus? He is in Amadeus. I thought so. Okay. He's very young in it, but he's in it. Yeah, he was very nice. He was very, very, very British. British. So, so nice. <laughs> That's my. <best. laughs> Where can people find uh, more about you? And uh, do you have a website, social? Media? Uh, I'm on all the socials. Uh, I'm usually Troxbirds. And that was a, that's a, there's the story. There's no story behind that. It's a stupid, okay. boring story. But uh, yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter and Instagram as Troxbirds. Uh, I'm on the Facebook. Some all that all that good stuff. And you can also go to SketchworksComedy.com uh, and find links to our YouTube channel. We do a new news break every Tuesday. It's so we we actually started that before COVID. But it's like hey, so we got uh, we do it's, it's 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 a weekend update thing. We make fun of. Well, we'll link to everything in the podcast. So okay. we'll, we'll put it in the YouTube podcast and it'll also be in the RSS in the description in the feed. So that'll be awesome. Great. Thanks for coming on, man. And, sure. uh, you know, much more luck and success in the future. And uh, we'd love to have you back next year, early next year. Or we want to come back. Dude. Let us know okay. when, you, when you can talk about the project that you can't yeah. talk about. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. And yeah. If you want to, if you want to have me on after Cobra Kai drops, I'll hop on whenever. Yeah, I'd love to have I'm, you back. Yeah, this was fun. I'm easy. Be great. I'm, I'm easy. I'm easy and I'm cheap. <laughs> Brian, thank you very much. Happy holidays. And Happy holidays. We'll talk to you in 2022. Awesome. Thanks for having me. <laughs>